Backyard Green Films is proud to present this episode of Agriculture with your host, Alara Bowman. Alara and her husband, Rick, travel throughout the land in their teardrop trailer that they have nicknamed Maggie, bringing you stories about their travels and the people they meet. They visit farmers, ranchers, and just about anyone who loves putting their hands in the dirt or their feet in stirrups. In those travels, they have gotten to meet some very interesting people. Here's one of those interviews. Hi, this is Alara. Welcome back to our podcast. The second interview we ever did on our filming escapade for the Holstein Dilemma was Dugan Tillman Brown of Firefly Farms in North Stonington, Connecticut. This was back in late 2016, and at this point on the quest, I was pretty green in terms of farming and conceptual experience. Okay, I'm still pretty green, but much less so now than then. Maybe by the time I'm 80, I'll start to ripen a little, considering how much there is to know in this area. But Firefly Farms is the place I fell in love. It happened knee-deep in a discussion of dung beetles, water retention, free-choice minerals, and pasture management, standing over a pile of cow manure. Now, if my 14-year-old niece saw the footage of that shoot, she would say she understands why I was enthralled. Good-looking young guy, reddish blondish hair tied back in a ponytail, direct gaze striding across pasture land, passionately forging the road ahead for his herd and land. We call Dugan the Viking when we're going over footage on the edit, by the way. But even if Dugan looks like he came straight out of central casting for that show, his dad, Van Bram, looks like the actual Viking they used as a consultant to figure out how to make things look realistic. And I have the feeling that Beth Tillman, Van's wife, has a strength of character and feisty determination that keeps them both towing the line, regardless of whether or not they can throw a battle axe. One of the sorrows of my shooting life is that we didn't get a chance to put the whole family at the dinner table and set up the camera to see what happened. Anyway, Dugan met us bright and early and spent the entire day patiently taking a film crew of three on a guided tour of their 135-acre farm in what I'm sure was well over 80-degree weather. He explained every animal on their farm and their purpose. He talked about integrated management, and why they hold a long view of their responsibility to the planet, the animals they raise, and the methodology they use. Why being a caretaker of the land is important, and why the animals are integrated into their farm in a way that works with nature instead of against it. Why they chose to start with heritage breeds, and why they keep at it, working both in their own farm breeding and testing program, and with conservancy organizations to make sure that when their heads hit the pillow, They haven't just talked about what might be good to do. They've lived and breathed it in a way that helps them sleep well at night. All the breeds of animals they raise at Firefly are incredibly rare, with total populations of less than 500 in number, including Randall cattle, Mulefoot and Guinea hawks, and Dorking chickens. As a farm, they've earned the label of Certified Humane, Now that might not mean anything to some of you, but I'll tell you it's an incredibly difficult high water mark to meet. It requires producers to pass requirements on all parts of the process, from birth to slaughter, crates, and feed. Temple Grandin is one of the people who wrote the American Meat Institute standards for that, by the way. If there's one thing that this family is not short on, it's moral courage and a work ethic. But anyway, back to love. We arrived at Firefly to film early in the morning, and Dugan warmly welcomed us and shook our hands and took our three-person crew right to the middle of the herd in the first pasture. I was awestruck at the sight of the Randall cattle. They don't look like an Angus or a Hereford or Holstein or anything you might have seen before. They are absolutely gorgeous. They have a distinctive patterning that looks a little like someone took a white cow and couldn't figure out whether to paint with a splatter method or a somewhat dry paint roller. And most of the black color variants have black points. That means the ears and the rings around the eyes, nose, teats, and feet are all black. So, hence the common panda reference. This breed almost went extinct, and they're one of the rarest breeds on the planet. 
They were started by the Randall family on a small farm in Sunderland, Vermont, as a closed herd for almost 100 years. After Everett Randall's death, crossbreeding and dispersal caused the numbers to get down to less than 20. Before a small miracle and a lot of blood, sweat, and tears saved the breed from extinction. There are still less than 500 Randall cattle, but the numbers are slowly getting better. The continuing efforts of farms like Firefly and people like Dugan are helping to make it happen. Dugan was passionate, intelligent, and invested. He spent hours in the pasture that day discussing the benefits of free choice minerals and how cattle know what they need. How their farm has become more drought tolerant, full of life, elastic, and diverse. How the universe is a beautiful place if we just let it do what it needs to do. I was enraptured. All of this would have been enough to make anyone fall in love with the handsome Viking, but I have a confession to make. The real moment I fell deeply and passionately in love on that day, it was with a bovine, a cow patty, a dung beetle, and a universal concept, and it's lasted ever since. My name is Dugan Tillman Brown. I work at Firefly Farms in North Stonington, Connecticut with my family, and we are conservatives of rare breeds. We deal with Randall cattle, with Dorking chickens, with Mulefoot hogs, and if I have my way shortly, we'll have rare breed rabbits, hopefully silver fox rabbits, and um, we're going to start working with a couple different varieties of rare breed turkeys. Dugan comes by farming honestly through genetics and environment. Here's why he does it. Okay, so oddly enough, when I was in high school, I went to uh, the Milton Academy Mountain School in Versailles, Vermont, that is very small, and it's a single semester program where kids choose to leave family and go there, and it is a working farm, and they produce almost all of their own food. Things like milk and out-of-season fruits and sugar and flour get brought in, but all of the meat and the veg is all raised by the students. And so the spring guys will plant the fields for the fall guys to harvest and we'll do the lambs and all that. So everyone works together to make the food. Well, one of my projects was I took care of the feeder pigs that came on and I fell in love with them. They were so smart and so curious and outgoing that I was like, you know what? I want to deal with these animals in the future. 15 years passes and life went on as it did. I still liked agriculture. I did aquaculture. My dad worked on aquaculture farms in Belize. We just liked growing things, but my parents were the ones that were sent off, go get the education, leave the farm. This is not for you. You need to have a real job. Well, this is the real job. All the other things are because we have people doing farming. And then, oddly enough, my dad got Lyme disease. Well, it was diagnosed with it. He had it for almost 20 years undiagnosed. And as we were trying to figure out what was going on with him, the farmer's market notoriety was growing at the same time and so we were eating more and more seasonal foods more and more local foods thinking that well maybe strawberries in January maybe he's got an allergy or maybe there's some sort of food allergy and then it became well maybe it needs to be organic maybe he's allergic to a pesticide or a fungicide and it was really through his health that we started realizing you know what we should probably be doing this because we would visit all these awesome farms and love what we saw but always wonder well but these guys are doing this plus one, and these guys are doing a shift on that. Why don't they all do the same thing? Because this is clearly so much more productive. And eventually it became a, you know what, put up or shut up. This is a hard job. Maybe there's a reason why farmers stop where they do. Well, we very quickly figured out there is. Um, it's just called workload, <laughs> and you can't do more. But we decided to start farming because we were concerned about the food my father was eating and believed that maybe if we raise the food the way we want, we could help them. And then we got a couple of pigs and realized, well, five pigs, yeah, we can raise that for the family, but if we raise 10 pigs, we can sell five 
and keep five. And then it was sort of like, well, but we want chickens too. So we got some chickens and then realized, wow, I can fit more in this spot if I raise some and then sell some. And so it was this nasty downward spiral of, it doesn't take that much more effort to raise 50 instead of 10. And then 50 became 200 and then 200 became 1,000 and five pigs became 250 pigs and it spiraled and it's awesome. I love it, but uh, no, I was not intending to be a farmer when I grew up for anything more than a gentleman farmer. And I'm not anymore. Now we're pretty gritty, muddy-shoed farming every day. I love it. And why did they choose Randall's? Well, so since we're in the, the Randall cattle field, the reason we chose these animals was multifold. They're beautiful. But the main reason we chose them is because they are a land race breed. They were specifically adapted to New England. They have the ability to be cold and wet for nasty winters, to thrive on very rocky, poor pastures, and they are very good at being a homestead animal. And since they never got a commercial interest, they were bred for docility and flavor. So as the, the dairy animals would have to produce a calf every year, the selection on flavor for the family was paramount because what's the point of eating bad tasting beef? And these guys have won almost every blind taste test they've ever been in. So Randall cattle kind of hit all the things we wanted. It was an animal that was going to have potential to be saved because they had a marketable trait. Homesteads don't really milk and make cheese anymore, so the marketable trait is meat. And they are incredibly fine textured meat, very high flavor, good fat qualities, good marbling back from the days when we actually cared about fat in the food versus the modern, oh, it must be lean, it must be flavorless. These guys, the Randall cattle, have excellent fat characteristics, excellent marbling characteristics, excellent grazing characteristics, they're small, they're easy to handle, and they taste brilliantly. Why does Firefly Farms like this breed? Can you tell me a little bit about the history of the Randall? Sure. The, the Randall cattle basically went extinct. They were saved by one woman 25, 30 years ago, and she recognized them for what they were and was in a position at the time that she could rescue the last kind of dozen and a half animals. They were down to just nothing. And she set about bringing the numbers back and then spreading the herds out to different places to try and get a little geological variation, but also different husbandry techniques so that people would begin to bring them back. And at this point, we've gone from, uh, who you talk to, the number changes, either 12 or 17 original animals from one herd that had been closed for like 30 years to now the sort of hip shot census of the animals. We have about 600 Randalls in existence now. And the Randall cattle are in desperate need of more help. They have not enough people with herds large enough to make good selection techniques. We have a lot of people who are helping with small herds, but we're missing the whole fingerprint on a lot of herds. We only have about uh, five farms with large herds to do the sort of breeding selection to be able to distribute to other small farms to keep their inbreeding down. And what we really need is a lot of enthusiasts to begin holding larger and larger herds so that we can have the potential of selection for stronger animals again. So, would you tell me what makes a Randall? Just describe it a little, please. Ooh, personality. Randalls are one of the more gentle, curious, and docile cows that I have ever been around. And kind of witnessed by the fact that here we are in a field with people they've never met, and they're not concerned, they're very laid back, they're just doing, they're just being cows. They're doing what they're supposed to do. These guys are phenomenal. 
They're very relaxing animals to be around. I very much love them. They're beautiful to look at. They're wonderful to work with. They're very malleable for your rearing techniques and what you want to do. They are intensely intelligent and they learn within days of when you bring new animals to your farm just by watching all the other animals and listening to you what is supposed to happen. They're very, very smart animals. Randall cattle are small. If there's only one trait you're going to see about a Randall cow is that they are petite when it comes in comparison with any of the modern cattle breeds. They are for the most part less than a thousand pounds. Most of my cows are in the 800 to 900 pounds and I have some that are smaller. So they're waist height. So very petite, very efficient on grass. What most people notice first and why they fall in love with them is the colors. And they have a wild palette of colors. Um, we call them by about four different names. We have whites, blues, blacks, and solids. And then we have, we're really fortunate to have a, a color variation of red. And reds are exceptionally rare. And it's sort of um, a modern mutation of the color gene much like blue eyes, it's a double recessive. And they're gorgeous, and they come in all the same patternings of the, the whites, blues, blacks, and reds, but they are, or solids, but they're red. And the intensity of the colors hasn't been traced, hasn't been tracked, and I personally don't want anybody to ever figure out what makes what color, because then people will select for it. What makes this herd so beautiful is the variation. It doesn't fit a modern breed profile. Modern breeds all look cookie cutter. And what makes these cows so wonderful is that while you can look at them and know instantly that's a Randall, there's so much variation that it's beautiful. I guess, um, so the, the face profile of the Randalls is very iconic. They generally have a, a white face, a black muzzle, and black panda ears. And they're usually very small ears and they have horns that are quite curled and they wrap their head very well. They use them just sort of prod each other around but the wonderful part about horned cattle and most people hate it is that these guys protect their babies. And the coolest thing I've ever seen by these exceptionally docile animals is when a coyote pack had them cornered and they have the strong enough instinct of an, sort of an unrefined cattle breed that all the babies will go behind the moms, all the moms will go shoulder to shoulder, head down and horns out. These guys are very, very good mothers and just fantastically protective of their babies while not being aggressive towards people. Interesting concept is the closed herd. Would you tell me a little bit about a closed herd and what that means, please? Okay, so a closed herd in most cases will be on a family farm that has decided that they like the genetics that they have and they like the work that they've been being done. Quite often it comes almost with a, a touch of xenophobia that they don't like what other people are doing, maybe more so than they like what they're doing. And so they begin working with their genetics to adapt them what they hope is perfectly to their farm, to their environment, to their nutrient load and their soils. And it means they're no longer bringing in outside genetics. So everyone quite rapidly becomes related. It's one family of all interrelated animals, which can be really wonderful or it can be very detrimental and that is where the skill of the husbander comes in. If the manager of the animals has a great eye for what is good and what is weak, they can really drive rapid genetic change. If dad dies and the son takes over and he has a different idea as to what needs to be done, you can really hurt the animals because they get pulled really hard one way and then there's a total shift in selection somewhere else and the animals can fall apart. Or if the 
the method. So we use a daily rotation with our cattle and the Randall seem to thrive very well on moving every single day to new grass. The grass does very, very well and the animals get healthier. So if I had bred them on closed herd to need that daily move where they get to select their entire diet and they get cookies and ice cream as well as salad and Brussels sprouts and everything, and then all of a sudden we change that management and now it's too much work to move them every day. Here's the pasture, let's just put them in there, we'll take them out in six months. We have a total different environment that these animals were not selected for. So closed herd, if the management technique is consistent and if the husbandry technique on selection is consistent, you can get an amazingly high quality animal out of that. If the plans keep changing and the management technique changes, it's very, very difficult for the breed to thrive. And then people will say, eh, they're not worth it, they're too hard, they're too fickle, they won't get fat, they're infertile. Usually that's not the fault of the animal, usually that's the fault of the farmer. So closed herd is a wonderful thing and we are very close to doing that. But it can be, it's a double-edged sword. Now I've heard that phrase, if you want to save a breed, you need to eat it. And I know that doesn't apply to all animals. Would you explain that one a little bit, please? Yeah, uh, saving a breed a forkful at a time is absolutely critical to getting their numbers up because if there's no market, if someone won't eat an animal, then they're a pet. And pets of this size are very expensive. So the only way to get more people interested in keeping them, besides some sort of uh, freak zoological specimen, is to have a market. And so one of the biggest jobs of someone who wants to save a rare breed is, is to find chefs who are willing to listen and work with you. And then you can convert them to actually using a phrase, much like the beef board did when 100% Angus came out wonderful marketing to make a single breed wildly popular and Angus is one of the most popular beef breeds in the world. Something of that nature and that creativity needs to happen to save a rare breed unless they're rare for a reason and there are certain breeds that go rare because there's something wrong. In the case of Randall's the something wrong is they don't fit the standard profile. Genetically they're strong Food-wise, for flavor and eating, they are incredible. Mothering capabilities are wonderful. The reason that they went rare is they're adapted for the homestead lifestyle. They're small, which means they're easy to take care of. It means they're good for newbies. They're wonderful animals for pastoral settings. They don't really do well in a confinement operation. So the reason these guys are rare is because they don't fit the industrial metric. For everything else that you might hope for, your iconic picture of Dick and Jane go to the farm, that's this. It's a very old-fashioned, very mellow animal that won't do a high-intensity environment. Would artificial insemination fit in a breeding program like the one at Firefly? Well. Artificial insemination is wonderful when you have limited access to a live bull. It requires a skill set which generally is not available on a small farm and you have to hire someone in for. So there's a limiting factor and timing is critical and the fertility of the cow and the nutritional status of her is critical. Can it be a really good tool? It can be exceptionally strong. There, with everything, there's a risk and a reward. We do not do artificial insemination. Partially because there's not enough information given. You can say that, oh, on paper, and I look at this pedigree, this is a great bull. He's got genetics I don't have. But if I look at a picture of this bull, he might be pathetic. He might be scrawny and no chest and long necked and, and very small testes but I got a vial of semen, you know, pedigree, he's perfect. The reason we use live cover is because I can look at every aspect of my bull and I have control. It does mean I have to hold bulls. So if you have a good semen source 
And by good, I mean you're able to look at the bulls and you have someone who can evaluate them. You're able to spread genetics from a strong sire widely and rapidly. The risk is overrepresentation. If I have a really great bull, and this has happened in the Holsteins, Holsteins have for independent genetic members, and there's like 600 million Holsteins in the world, but if you actually run through how many genetic individuals there are in the herd, there's like 70, just because they have used one sire, and he might have you know, 10,000 offspring. There's no way in his whole life he ever could have made that many calves, but he had a trait that everybody wanted, so they bought the semen, and he got too widely distributed. So that's the risk with it. With only 600 animals, it's even more of a risk. If I have one bull who for one year everyone thought was popular, he had a perfect color or something like that, and too many people use him, he may have had a fault, but he looked brilliant, and, and his, his faulty gene will be too widely distributed. So it's a marvelous technique, especially if you have some cows who are maybe having trouble getting bred, and you want to use a really strong bull, it's a wonderful, wonderful tool. But it's only that. It's not a catch-all, and it's not perfect. It's a good tool. It can be applied wrong, but it can also do an amazing, wonderful corrective action to a herd. We choose to use bulls. Um, they do a much better job of storing the semen, and I don't have to worry about you know liquid nitrogen running out. So. But that's just a personal preference. Some people are afraid of bulls. And with improper treatment, bulls can be exceptionally dangerous. What's wonderful with Randall cattle is they've been bred for hundreds of years to be docile. So the bulls are, even as they get older, remain very calm. And for the most part, I can move my bulls around just by snapping my fingers and talking. They're very laid back. How do you think that rare breeds can contribute to our agricultural production model today? So rare breeds impact is an indirect on commercial agriculture, their impact. It is not a today impact. What it is is much more like a seed library. Rare breeds are a fail safe and much the same way that when we had a potato blight, we had to go back and find the original Peruvian potatoes and start breeding them forward for the resistances, or the apple blight when we had to go find primitive apples, or we've had corn blights. This is the same thing because those primitive varieties that still existed somewhere have a beneficial gene that might help them withstand. It's not that a Randall cow is going to become the best breeder for a commercial dairyman. But where they come into play is when the monocrop agriculture, monostock, livestock has a problem. You have access to a primitive gene that has been selected for resistance for ages. These animals don't get treated with anything. They're not getting vaccines. They're not getting deworming sprays or anti-fly sprays or shots of things to help them do whatever that genetically, if they were in a natural environment, they would do on their own these animals still have natural selection, so they are much more robust. Uh, in essence, what the, the protection of rare breeds is, is the sort of tractors versus race cars. They both have engines, they both have tires, they both go round and round. Industrial agriculture is based on race cars. These guys are tractors. Tractors gonna go up any hill over any obstacle and just keep rolling. It's not gonna get there fast, but it will get there. The industrial agriculture has selected so carefully for a single trait that when you stop putting racing fuel inside the race car, the engine 
can't handle it. It knocks, it smokes, it sputters. So that's what these guys are, is they're the, well, the race car broke down, we gotta go get the tractor to pull it out. And that's what, that's what rare breeds are, is they have traits that are not important commercially. Um, we'd like to think that they are. Uh, but these guys have been selected for personality because they don't have a steel frame keeping you safe from them. They've been selected for flavor because there was no point in selecting them for anything else because they were meant for families. And why is a family going to eat anything that's subpar? They have influence and impact that goes beyond what industrial ag cares about. So they're, they're really the rest of the color palette. So we have a really strong monochromatic painting with industrial agriculture and the rare breeds are the pastels and the patterns and the, the off hues. And they're what really will make the picture shine at the end. You're welcome. If you liked our podcast, please subscribe. This is how we keep going. And please tell your friends to join us. Please feel free to post any questions or comments that you might have to our social media sites. Our Twitter feed is at Backyard Green Films, spelled B-K-Y-R-D-G-R-E-E-N-F-I-L-M-S. Our Instagram is at Backyard Green Films, B-A-C-K-Y-A-R-D-G-R-E-E-N-F-I-L-M-S. Our Facebook is Backyard Green Films. Our YouTube URL is youtube.com Backyard Green Films. We would like to thank Dugan for taking time to speak with us and for the wonderful tour of the farm. If you'd like to find out more about Dugan and his family, please visit firefly.farm. Also, to find out more about the Randall cattle and the other heritage breeds he and his family raise at their farm, please visit the Livestock Conservancy at livestockconservancy.org. You have been listening to Agriculture with your host, Alara Bowman. Please tune in for more upcoming episodes from our travels. I'm Rick Bowman, your behind-the-scenes editor. Until next time. This has been a presentation of Backyard Green Films Productions, all rights reserved, copyright 2020.